today we're going to be doing the current affairs again uh, for 18th of uh, march 2022 uh, today we have some very interesting topics uh, one of the topics that is very interesting and very important from the exam point of view is the fuel cell and then apart from that uh, we can talk about indo sri lanka relations in detail and also covid cases have started peaking in asia again i think you must have come across it in the news but covid cases are peaking in asia again especially places like south korea china singapore vietnam and not just asia these cases are also peaking in new zealand australia again uh rest of the topics are very static apart from this one topic which gets connected to india russia relations because indian uh, oil firms especially the state oil firms such as the ioc such as the hpcl they are buying russian oil it is known as ural so basically crude oil when it's bought in different different places it is known by the place name itself like when you buy the crude oil um uh which is of uh, usa it is known as the west texas intermediate wti also when you buy this uh, uh other crude oil it is known as the brent crude oil brent is a place near uh, europe of the coast of uk and similarly okay and urals uh, this is the name of the crude oil that is produced in russia okay okay moving on the first topic that we'll discuss is that the covid cases are peaking in many asian countries okay now what is the corona virus the corona virus looks like a uh this with the spike protein on the top okay this is your corona virus you can draw these pictures during the exam and this will actually help you out in getting better marks and since it's a virus it always needs a host in order to multiply okay they can cause respiratory infections and they can cause this thing known as the cyt- cytokine storm which we will discuss right now okay uh it looks like a spiky ball like what we had discussed the spikes also help the virus to enter into the cells and take over the cells mechanism so that the virus can multiply okay virus multiplies now currently why is it in the news the number of covid 19 cases reached a peak across many asian countries in the previous week south korea it started seeing 3.9 lakh ke average daily cases which means that if you remember in india at the top of our second wave we started having 4 to 4 and a half lakh cases on a daily basis similarly south korea is having around 4 lakh cases for a country that is as small as south korea also vietnam is having 2 and 1/2 lakh cases on a daily basis malaysia 30000 cases okay and thailand all of them they recorded their highest single day rise in infections during the past week while singapore and japan they recorded their pandemic peak in february but their cases are declining currently they already had their uh, peak and now the peak is flattening cases in china are fast accelerating around one uh, this should probably be 1000 average cases it has reached 35% of its pandemic peak okay now before all of this we need to remember one more thing uh even countries in central and western europe and southeast asian countries have witnessed a rise in the number of covid cases i'm talking about even central europe and western europe okay even these countries have seen a rise in the covid cases along with the southeast asian countries uh and even australia and new zealand like what i had uh, spoken of all of them are uh, witnessing a pi- uh, spike in cases so it seems like this uh, virus will just keep we- giving out waves after waves and we'll have to be ready okay now uh, one more news that was there very recently in the last couple of hours was that china had its first reported death of coronavirus pandemic in over one year so in greater than one year 
in the last one year china has not reported a death because of coronavirus pandemic and this has been the first death okay some of the important terms which are related to coronavirus are r not you know what r not is r not is the number of people an infected person can infect on an average okay it is the basic reproduction number this is the number of new infections caused by one infected individual in a population it determines whether an epidemic can occur the rate of growth of the epidemic the size of the epidemic and the level of effort needed to control the infection if r not is 2 then one individual can infect two other people okay positivity rate this is nothing but the number of positive people amongst every 100 tested individuals they are the people who are tested positive who are uh, amongst those who are completely tested okay if the positivity rate is high it is possible that only high risk uh, groups are being tested a low positivity rate can also indicate that not enough testing is being done also a high positivity rate means that more testing has to be done and also more diagnosis has to be done and oxygen uh, you know production has to be increased okay cytokine storm okay so usually people who get coronavirus they normally are affected by the cytokine storm now cytokine storm is nothing but an immune reaction which is produced by our body itself so an immune reaction triggered by the body to fight an infection is known as a cytokine storm okay the body releases too many cytokines proteins that are involved in immunomodulation immunomodulation means negating the virus fighting that virus while normally they regulate the immune response in this case they cause harm and even they cause death these cytokines dilate the blood vessels which means that they increase the size of blood vessels increase size of vessels increase the temperature and heartbeat besides throwing blood clots into the system and suppressing the oxygen utilization because of reduced oxygen uh, you because of reduced oxygen supply to the body and there is there is insufficient supply of oxygen to the body and automatically you know it leads to hypoxia and it leads to multi organ failure okay if the cytokine flow is high and continues without cessation the body's own immune response will lead to hypoxia which is insufficient oxygen and it leads to multi organ failure and death hence it is not just the virus it is this cytokine storm which is a response of the body to the virus which is causing the death okay the rt pcr this is the next uh, terminology we have discussed about the rt pcr in detail previously but we'll just do it on a basic sense it is nothing but the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction okay now in this what happens is that Uh, because corona virus is nothing but an rna virus corona is an rna virus and rna viruses are tough to detect so first what happens is conversion of this corona virus into a dna virus using the technique which is known as transcription so this reverse transcription out of this rt pcr so transcription converts the rna into dna now it becomes easier to detect the coronavirus okay and the polymerase chain polymerase chain reaction what this does is that this will uh it it uh, amplifies the dna component it amplifies the dna component and it creates multiple versions of the a uh, dna component okay like uh, dna fragments are copied and one is made into two two are made into four and hence the dna is amplified into many numbers okay which will become easier to detect it and also a fluorescent d uh, binding dye called as the probe is added to the dna so that it becomes easier in order to identify the virus on the fluorometer okay okay uh this is fluorescent in color and uh, a fluorescent probe is added to the dna okay moving on antibody tests okay now you know what the difference between rt pcr is and the antibody tests okay okay in rt pcr you are checking for the presence of the virus itself whereas in the case of antibody tests 
okay you are checking the presence of antibodies which are produced by the body in response to the virus these tests check your blood by looking for antibodies and that means that you have had past infection of sars cov virus antibodies are proteins that help to fight off the infections and are specific to every disease granting immunity against getting that particular disease again an antibody test with poor specificity is not believed to be effective in detecting new infections next convalescent plasma therapy this is nothing but adding of antibodies that one person has generated these antibodies are prevalent in the plasma so a person who has gotten covid can donate his plasma to new people who are getting affected by the virus and that will help to fight off the virus apart from that flattening the curve is nothing but reducing the number of peak cases uh, reducing the peak of the disease which is reducing the number of maximum cases in one day okay herd immunity herd immunity is when the entire population has immunity or if a large percentage of the population has immunity they have already gotten the virus or they have received the vaccination that way they'll be a little immune to the virus and because a large percentage of the population has immunity you know the other small people who have not been uh, immunized to the virus they are also protected why because when a person gets vaccinated against a disease their risk of infection is reduced so they are also less likely to transmit the virus okay that is the reason why these people are protected and there is less possibility of the infected person to pass the pathogen to the other person herd immunity does not mean unvaccinated or individuals who have not previously been infected are themselves immune no these people are not immune over here these people are just protected because the others are immune okay now this can happen in the case these people are not in a position to get the virus if they have very weak if they have very weak immune systems then it is not possible to give them any vaccination protection in those cases you know they can be protected by putting them in a group who have high vac high uh, immunity next news sri lanka extends 1 billion dollar credit to i'm sorry india extends 1 billion dollar credit to sri lanka india extended a 1 billion dollar credit uh, facility to sri lanka to assist the island nation through its worst foreign exchange crisis and enable it to procure food and medicines and essential items okay the sri lanka finance minister was in india i think his name is basil rajapaksa and uh, he met the prime minister he met the finance uh, minister he met also the external affairs minister an agreement to this effect was signed between the state bank of india and uh, the government of sri lanka during a visit of the country's finance minister basil rajapaksa to new delhi he has he had also met the prime minister narendra modi who had to discuss indian assistance amid sri lanka's extraordinary economic crisis please remember that uh, sri lanka falls within india's definition of neighborhood first policy and hence it is our goal to reach out to the smaller countries in 2022 india has so far extended 1.4 billion dollars of support to sri lanka already okay this is a lot of money through a 400 million dollar currency swap we had discussed this deferral of 0.5 billion dollar loan and another half billion dollar as a line of credit for purchasing of fuel so apart from this 1.4 billion dollars india is again providing 1 billion dollars of credit right now in order to buy food medicines and other essential items sri lanka is facing its worst financial crisis and had declared an emergency in august in the face of crippling foreign exchange crisis why because the tourist arrivals from covid has died down and if there is no tourists then automatically there is no forex in china and also the country's exports including the exports of tea have taken a hit and because of this also there are no there is no foreign exchange the nation is still facing significant fuel and gas shortages and high inflation in essential goods as well as food items it has triggered a series of protests sri lanka is also due to repay foreign debt worth 7 billion dollars this year it has already sought china's help to restructure its loans that amount to 10% of its total foreign debt now if china is helping out sri lanka then it's also india's duty to help out sri lanka otherwise you know sri lanka might become closer to china and that is a problem for india sri lanka is known as a floating ship 
in the Indian Ocean. It has a very strategic location to target India. And hence, India was always scared about foreign intervention in uh, Sri Lanka. Even in the 1980s, Sri Lanka, when it gave birthing rights to America, to the US, okay, India was extremely scared. And it was nervous about the presence of the American so close to India's coast. Okay, major collaborations between the country. Recently, the Exim Bank of India and the government of Sri Lanka signed a $500 million line of credit agreement that would help Sri Lanka cope with fuel shortages like what we discussed. Earlier, India also announced that it would defer Sri Lanka's debt repayment of $500 million by two months and extended a $400 million currency swap agreement. India-Sri Lanka trade is $6.2 billion with India's exports being $4.7 billion and uh, imports being $1.5 billion. Okay. Now, please remember that India and Sri Lanka have a free trade agreement. India is Sri Lanka's largest trading partner. But Sri Lanka is India's second largest. Who is the largest trading partner of India within the SARC ecosystem? It is Bangladesh. Okay. Both signed MOUs for development of Trincomali port and LNG terminals in Kerwala Pitya. Okay, Trincomali port is one and Kerwala Pitya is another. Joint Indo-Japan agreement to develop Eastern Container Terminal. However, this was terminated and Western uh, uh, Container Terminal was given to India, which was not in India's favor. India wanted to develop the Eastern Container Terminal because it has a very strategic location at the Colombo Harbour. Okay, India has taken up building infrastructure in northern and eastern provinces. Why? These are the provinces which are populated majorly by Tamils. Okay, when we look at this map, Tamils are majorly located over here. This is completely by Tamils. And this part is also by Tamils. And because of the Elam War, Elam War 4, the infrastructure of Tamils has been disrupted. Hence, India has taken up this role in order to rebuild housing over here, rebuild electric lines over here, and all sorts of social infrastructure, providing education. India has taken up several roles. India has even upgraded Jaffna Colombo railway track. You know where Jaffna is? This is Jaffna over here at the top. Okay. And India is not just, uh, you know, doing any work. India is doing one of the most productive work over there because uh, India is even upgrading this Jaffna Colombo railway track. Do you see how big it is? It covers the entire island nation nearly. Okay, India is also rebuilding the Kankesan Turai port. One more port uh, along with Trincomalee port, Kerwala Pitaya, Eastern Container Terminal at the Colombo port. India is also building Kankesan Turai port. Okay, next. And providing electricity transmission line for power importers. India is also providing an electric transmi electricity transmission line for power import in Sri Lanka. Okay. Now, Indian firms buy more oil from Russia. Energy ties may deepen. You can call. So, India and Russia's relation is known as a special and privileged strategic partnership. Special and privileged strategic partnership. Call it as SPSP or SP square. Okay. Now, diplomatic relations between both the countries began in 1947 itself. Bilai steel plant was constructed with Russian cooperation. Okay, Aryabhatta, the first satellite of India, was launched in Russian uh, space shuttle. India had signed the Treaty of Peace, Friendship and Cooperation with Russia in 1971. After this, India got enough confidence to intervene in Bangladesh. Okay, please remember. India is expected to deepen energy cooperation with Russia as well. Several major Western economies have continued to source Russian energy despite tough US sanctions. Even the other Western economies are sourcing Russian energy and India has decided to take a very practical step. India is also sourcing Russian energy because we are getting it at a cheaper cost. We are getting it somewhere between 25 to 30 dollars while the price of uh, crude oil in the world has risen to more than 110 dollars per barrel. After the Indian oil cooperation, which brought 3 million barrels last year, last week, HPCL has bought 2 million barrels of Russian crude oil as major uh, Indian energy importers forge ahead with attempts to secure 
Russian energy supply. Okay, this will secure energy security as oil and gas market continues to witness volatility in the backdrop of European developments over the past few weeks. What is this European development? Ukraine versus Russia war. However, energy cooperation with Russia will require some necessary adjustments in the financial front. Why? Because uh, we know that Russian banks are under swift sanctions and hence we need to modify uh, the import. The move shows that the government has adopted a pragmatic approach in this matter and is likely to forge ahead. Another, like what we said, it's a practical approach. Another similar uh, agreement or tender has been floated by MRPL, which has floated a tender for 1 million barrels. Indian orders for Russian crude oil are prompted by the fact that Western sanctions have forced many countries to avoid Russian oil and gas. This has created an opportunity for some of the major energy importers like India who can source Russian crude oil from the market, special discounts. So what uh, Indian uh, manufacturers are doing is that Indian Oil Corporation or HPCL, they get this Russian Ural crude and they refine this crude in order to produce petrol, diesel, okay air turbine fuel etc now one thing is that these are not directly procured from russia itself rather these are procured through other traders ioc and hpcl they float a tender and traders can apply for this tender these traders can be any person and they apply for this particular tender okay uh like what I said, uh, IOC had bought 3 million barrels of Urals last week at 20 to 25 dollars. Okay. However, companies which are deeply uh, intertwined with US economy, like Reliance Industry, which is a private company, is not able to buy Urals because then that may cause Rus Russian sanctions to fall on uh, Reliance. Okay because IOC and HPCL don't have such huge exposures to the US market, then they can procure. Most of their uh, operations are within India itself. Russia was not amongst the top energy suppliers to India in the past. Okay, they were Saudi, Iraq. These were the countries which were majorly supplying uh, energy to India. But now this can result in Russia being one of the top energy suppliers. In fact, last year ONGC, and IOC, they signed a MOU with Gazprom in order to supply energy to India. Gazprom is Russian state-led energy supplier. Role of ICJ. As the Russia-Ukraine conflict continues to escalate, the United Nations top court ordered Moscow to halt its military operations in Ukraine. Okay, this comes as Russia has intensified its major shelling and airstrikes around major uh, cities known as Kyiv. Kharkiv, Sumy, all these are major cities where Russia has been doing severe attacks. Also, one of India's own judges known as Mr. Dalvir Bandari, he has voted against this uh, Russian war with Ukraine. Okay, uh, oh, just a second. Yeah, he has voted against Russian uh, war against Ukraine. He has gone with the majority decision at the ICJ. Okay, however, Mr. Bandari's vote against Russia, it does not re represent India's stance. And it is an independent move. Why? Because justices who are at the ICJ, though they are, you know, lobbied by the government, uh, they are supported by various government organizations. However, the decisions that they take over there is more of a personal decision. It's an independent decision. Okay. Background. Ukraine has accused Russia of falsely claiming that acts of genocide have occurred in Luhansk and Donetsk and using that as a pretext to recognize the independence of these regions and going to war against Ukraine. Ukraine take, took the case to ICJ saying that you know, Russia has falsely accused that there is genocide which is happening in Luhansk and Donetsk regions. And because of Russia accusing it of genocide, it has gone for a war against Ukraine. Okay. Now, what is the International Court of Justice? We have discussed this earlier. It is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. 
okay it is one of the six organs principal organs of the united nations the others being the un secretariat ecosoc okay ecosoc the general assembly okay the security council the trusteeship council okay okay uh, these are the other five okay it is only one of the six principal organs of the un which is not located in new york city why because all the others are in new york city its official languages are english and french icj has 15 judges who are elected to nine year terms by the unga and security council which votes simultaneously but separately and also judges who be nominated can be renominated that is how mr dalvir bandari has been renominated again okay no unlike other organs of the international organizations you know like who or imf the court is not composed of representatives of governments so these people who are there they are not representatives of governments they are rather independent judges whose first task before taking up their duties is to make a solemn declaration in open court that they will exercise their powers impartially so even during their declaration they have to declare that they will exercise their powers impartially and not on the basis of pressure exerted by their countries pressure of countries okay that is why mr bandari he took an independent decision to vote against russian aggression the judges are distributed as per different regions okay this is where the 15 judges come from okay the court's role is to settle in accordance with international law legal disputes submitted to it by states and also give advisory opinions on legal issues referred to it by authorized united nations organs and specialized agencies it settles cases between various countries it also gives uh, recommendations to various countries and also it gives uh, recommendations to specialized agencies like who uh, like uh, unesco etc okay it has no jurisdiction to try individuals why because this is the role of the international criminal court which is also at hague but it is governed by the rome statute okay of uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity as it is not a criminal court it does not have prosecutor ability to initiate proceedings the icj is not an apex court to which national courts can turn to okay it is not an apex court like from supreme court it doesn't go to icj rather only when all the all the courts have failed to deliver justice then cases go to icj okay it does also does not act like an appeal court for international tribunals however it can make a ruling on the validity of the arbitration awards also awards of the tribunals don't go to the icj you know as an appeal rather it can take it can make a verdict on the validity of that tribunal award itself if the tribunal can give that award okay but it does not go into the uh, award of the tribunal okay as to what award it has given and if it can overrule it or not okay icj cannot so more to take up a case it can only hear a case when requested to do so by the independent states and also the un security council can recommend a case to the icj so either one of the parties can take it to the icj or the unsc can do it rather icj cannot take up cases so more to no so more to powers okay pradhan mantri ujjwala yojana okay there was an independent impact assessment of the ujjwala yojana and it has said that over 1.5 lakh lives have been saved and 13% reduction in air pollution related deaths okay key observations are that there has been a reduction in death like what we said there has been a great because of the greater penetration and use of lpg cylinders it has prevented 1.5 lakh pollution related deaths in 2019 itself okay what is this is a huge saving reduction in pollution it has also avoided 8 million tons of pm 2.5 emissions in 2019 13% reduction in air pollution deaths this would have been emitted had biomass been burnt okay because lpg is being used okay no pm 
is released or very less PM 2.5 is re released, which has resulted in a 13% reduction in air pollution related deaths. Okay, recently there was one more research from IIT Kanpur and that had shown a vast improvement in uh, reduction of respiratory diseases and also improvement of general health conditions in villages with high coverage of Ujwala Yojana found that 50% improvement in general health conditions in villages of Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, which had a high coverage of Ujwala connections. What is the Ujwala Yojana? Its aim is to provide LPG connections to poor households and reduce health risk associated with burning of biomass, okay, empowering women, reducing the number of deaths due to unclean cooking fuel and preventing young children from uh, respiratory illnesses due to uh, within the house pollution, it is known as indoor pollution. Okay. And what happens outside is known as outdoor pollution. Now, what are the features? It was launched in the year 2016 and it is implemented by the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Okay. Initially, 5 crore people below poverty households were tra targeted for providing LPG connections but this has been expanded more than to more than 8 crore now okay currently I believe 9 crore people have received it so initial numbers were 5 crore but because of the success of the scheme it has expanded to 8 crores BPL is a person who suffers from at least one deprivation under the socio-economic caste census according to this uh, scheme socio-economic caste census of 2011 who are the eligible beneficiaries? They are identified through the socio-economic caste census like what I said. And such names who are not covered under SECC list, beneficiaries are identified uh, as if they fall under these categories. Okay, All SEST households who are beneficiaries of PMAY, Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, all of them who are beneficiaries of Antodhya Anna Yojana, forest dwellers, uh, most backward classes and then T and XT garden tribes okay so even forest dwellers get it and also people residing in islands and people residing in river islands get it uh, however there is one more uh, restriction over here in that no one in the applicant's household should own an LPG connection if they own an LPG connection they are not eligible okay and also, the household income of the family per month must not exceed a certain limit as defined by the state governments. So, state governments or the UTs will declare a particular income level and that income level should not be crossed by that uh, household. Okay, And the applicant should also not be a recipient of similar uh, government scheme. If it has been launched at the state level, it should not be a recipient of that particular scheme. Only then, will they be eligible for this scheme they can either be under this list or they can be any of these people to receive it what are the benefits given a cash assistance is provided of 1600 rupees now that cash assistance it comprises of security deposit of 1250 it comprises of pressure regulated which is worth uh, 150 rupees lpg hose worth 100 rupees Domestic gas consumer card which is worth 25 rupees and installation charges of 75 rupees. Additionally, all PMUI beneficiaries will be provided with first LPG refill and also a stub, both free of cost. Okay, please remember all these are the benefits which are given. And we have spoken about the achievements already. Currently, there are 9 crore new LPG connections which have been rolled out under the scheme. And also 99% of the existing India has around 28 crore households okay okay the next topic is india unveils its arctic policy focus is on combating climate change now these are the main uh, goals of the policy okay uh, please go through them to enhance india's cooperation with the arctic region to harmonize polar research by you know equating himalayas with the poles and to contribute to the efforts to enhance humankind's understanding of the arctic region to strengthen international efforts on combating climate change and protecting the environment to advance the study and understanding of the arctic within india okay the center has released india's arctic policy with the aim of enhancing the country's cooperation with the resource rich and rapidly transforming 
transforming region all the countries including russia china they have all received uh, they have all re- released their arctic policies india had earlier in january it had released a draft policy uh, which contains five objectives and now india has updated its own draft policy and it has released the arctic policy which contains six uh, main goals or objectives okay now these six objectives are science and research economic and human development cooperation climate and environmental protection transport and connectivity governance and international cooperation and national capacity building okay now india's uh, connection with the arctic began in the year 1920 itself when india signed this svalbard treaty svalbard treaty recognizes the control of norway over svalbard okay so india has been long associated with the arctic region and why is arctic important for india it is important from the purview of scientific research climate change and environment okay to understand monsoons okay we need to understand the arctic because the changes occurring in the arctic are uh, impacting the global weather climate and ecosystem including monsoons of india okay and monsoons are very important because uh, most of the agriculture in india is still rain fed okay rising sea level to understand the rising sea level you need to understand the loss of ice in arctic and also to understand the weather conditions in himalayas it is important to understand what is happening in the arctic because the arctic and the himalayas though they are geographically distant they are interconnected and they share similar concerns hence the arctic meltdown will help scientific community better understand the glacial melt in the himalayas okay next economic and human resources india can generate mineral resources and hydrocarbons from the arctic arctic region has rich deposits of coal gypsum diamonds and also reserves of zinc lead gold quartz etc greenland alone possesses about a quarter of the world's rare earth reserves and what is the other country that possesses rare earth reserves it is china and hence uh, you know in case of a confrontation with china india can still secure its rare earth reserves from greenland or from the arctic india is the third largest energy consuming country and hence uh, energy components such as coal are always important to india it is the third largest oil importer and the fourth largest importer of gas okay uh, arctic can therefore potentially address india's energy security needs next geopolitical and strategic uh, importance of arctic like i told you china and russia have released their policy papers on arctic china is also planning to uh, implement the polar silk road which will cut down its transport and improve logistics of chinese goods and also china calls itself as a near arctic state though china is nowhere close to arctic this is what china's white paper on arctic policy calls china okay uh next russia okay russia accounts for half of the total arctic in terms of area even though russian arctic houses only 1.5% of russia's population its contribution to the country's gdp is 15% it's massive also the opening of shipping routes and possibilities of increased resource extraction from arctic is leading to us china russia and nato jockeying for influence in the region and if india stops or if india is uh, not active then it will be uh, out of the race for the arctic objectives of the policy strengthening the national capabilities and competencies in science and exploration climate and environmental protection maritime and economic protection uh, maritime and economic cooperation with the arctic region institutional and human resource capacities will also be strengthened within the government and academic research and business institutions there will also be interministerial coordination in pursuit of india's interests in the arctic enhancing understanding of the impact of climate change on arctic on india's uh, climate like what is said on india's monsoon contributing to better analysis prediction and coordinated policy making on the implications of arctic ice melting on india's economy military etc etc okay and uh, it also tries to secure global shipping routes energy security and exploitation of mineral wealth all of this is what we had discussed earlier okay and also studying the linkages between polar regions and himalayas deepening of cooperation between india and countries of the arctic region under various arctic forums and also increasing india's participation in the arctic council what is the arctic council it is a grouping of all the arctic countries 
where India has observer status. India is not a member of the Arctic Council, but rather India has observer status. Even China has observer status. Next topic. India's first hydrogen-powered fuel cell electric car project. The Union Ministry of Road Transport and Highways has inaugurated a pilot project for hydrogen-based fuel cell electric vehicle. It is a project that is between Toyota and International Center for Automotive Testing. Uh, they have initiated this pilot project to study and evaluate the world's most advanced uh, fuel combustion electric vehicle, which is Toyota Mirai, which runs on hydrogen on Indian roads and climatic conditions. Okay, now, how does a fuel cell work? Okay, a fuel cell basically, especially in the case of hydrogen. Okay, let's say this is the fuel cell. And then in the fuel cell, you have two components, which is hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, now this is the anode, let's say. Okay, and this is the cathode. At the anode, you have hydrogen. Anode, you have hydrogen. And at the cathode, you have oxygen. Cathode and you have oxygen. And oh, this space is filled by electrolyte. Okay. You fill this with O2. Okay. Now, as soon as you fill in this fuel over here, you're sending in the fuel over here. As soon as you send in the fuel, this hydrogen uh, ions, they travel across the electrolyte. And they go and combine with oxygen. And in the output, it produces clean water. However, when hydrogen ions travel, it is only H plus that travels. And the electrons, they go around the electrolyte. And this stream of electrons is nothing but electricity. This can be used to power your car. While the output is just going to be H2O, which is water. Okay. And that's all. And unused gases. Okay. Which is, say, some amount of hydrogen. Okay, now how does this hydrogen fuel cell work in an electric vehicle? A fuel cell electric vehicle is essentially a hybrid electric vehicle wherein international combustion, where the internal combustion engine is replaced with a fuel cell stack. Instead of having an internal combustion of diesel, petrol, you have a combustion of hydrogen. Okay, that is the fuel cell. The onboard sources of power include hydrogen as well as an advanced battery system. Along with hydrogen, you also have a battery system. The fuel cell combines hydrogen and oxygen to generate an electric current, water being the only byproduct, like what we had discussed. Fuel cells generate electricity through an electrochemical process. We had seen the electrochemical process H2 plus O2. Okay. Now, uh, and there are no moving parts in a fuel cell. So they are more efficient and reliable as compared to internal combustion engines. How is it different from an electric vehicle? Okay, so ICE and fuel cells have some similarities and they also have some dissimilarities. Similarities are that both of them have internal reactions, combustion reactions that happen. However, this does not have any moving parts, while this has moving parts like pistons and all of that. How is the fuel cell electric vehicle different from a battery electric vehicle? Unlike a battery electric vehicle, it does not store energy. There is no stored energy. Rather, it relies on a constant supply of fuel and oxygen like internal combustion engine okay it uh, while the internal combustion engine requires petrol or diesel now advantages of fuel cells they produce much smaller quantities of greenhouse gases and none of the air pollutants cause health problems if pure hydrogen is used fuel cells emit only heat and water as the byproduct they are also energy efficient as compared to traditional combustion technologies unlike the battery powered electric vehicles most models they exceed 300 kilometers you know, battery electric vehicles only have lesser than 300 kilometers. Well, FCEVs can be more than uh, 300 kilometers. And plus you can have a battery attached, which can enhance the uh, distance. Disadvantages are that producing oxygen or uh, producing hydrogen in India, it is usually brown hydrogen, not green hydrogen or blue hydrogen. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, it is gray hydrogen, I believe which is produced through burning of fossil fuels and hence it is still very polluting. There are also questions over safety as hydrogen is more explosive than petrol. What if there is an untoward in incident and there is a blast that happens?